I'm standing here today beside our Total Boat Works skiff, the skiff that we've been building for this video series. Now today's going to be a little bit different because I'm not going to do any work, but I am going to do some talking. I have a list here in front of me on paper that's been compiled from all the comments we've been getting in. We invited you guys to send some comments in and uh, there's nothing that I'd rather do than talk back to all of you guys. So what's going to happen is we're going to read some questions off of this list and I'm going to be under a little pressure maybe here to answer them. I don't know if I can answer them or not. I haven't read these questions before so let's just get started. Now the first question here is from Stuart. It says, greetings from Ireland. I love this series in your natural charisma. Well, thank you for that. Uh, it's a joy to watch. Uh, I've built a few stitch and glue type boats over the years, so my question regarding this skiff is how does it remain watertight without the use of sealant between the planks? Well, it does remain watertight, I can tell you that, because when these planks get tight, they swell up so tight against each other, and they've got that perfectly nice, smooth, mating surface that they just mate right up to each other perfectly, and no water can get through there. They swell really tightly against each other. That's what keeps the water out. There really isn't any need for any sealant in there, or tongue and groove, or anything like that, or biscuits, or dowels, all of those things would probably cause me all kinds of troubles, and certainly later on down the road. Like, uh, if you doweled the planks together, and you had to replace some of these planks, that would certainly be difficult, and uh, the way it's built, all of the bottom planks are replaceable, and uh, there's no sealant between them, because these boats, at times during the year, people used to let these things dry out, and they would open up, and there'd be a space between the planks. Now, if you had sealant in there, it could probably trap dirt against the sealant. You could have all kinds of problems with it, really. And really, this is the accepted way that many, many skiff builders learn to build these skiffs after experimenting with putting sealant or cotton caulking or doing any of these different things. We've learned that this is the easiest, fastest, and best way to make the bottom on one of these work skiffs. The next question is from someone called Ain't Gonna Happen. Love these videos, brother. Question, when did you start working on boats? And can you tell us a little more about your career, how you started, etc.? You know, I started working on boats so long ago <laughs> that I can't even remember when I started working on boats. It was when I was a very, very young kid working on my father's boats. Now, that's the way we got started, and it was necessary. We couldn't just do it if we wanted to. We had to do it. So we did it, and uh, it wasn't always even with a smile on our face, but as I grew up, I learned to really enjoy it, and I wanted to make a living out of it, and I started in boatyards when I was very, very young, and I started building some very small craft when I was very young. And uh, it's just been something I worked my way into. I appreciated when I was a kid, and that's all I can tell you. I don't want to give you my entire history, but uh, that's how it's done. You develop an interest when you're very young, and you go with it. Our next comment here is from Tom Moore. Louis, thank you for making these videos. As stated many times, your craftsmanship and shipwriting skills are definitely inspirational. But what I appreciate the most is your well-spoken explanation of why, not just how, you are doing what you're doing. Well, I appreciate that too, and uh, I think when we started out, that was one of the things we had in mind, was to not just show people that we were doing things, like a lot of programs that I've seen, but it's actually uh, how we're doing the things. And then, uh, you know, as I get to thinking about it over the years here, uh, I started realizing that never mind showing you how we're doing things, but we also have to show people why we're doing different things. And uh, so I guess we've got it covered. It's sure fun doing it. And... Uh, I hope you actually get a lesson out of it so that you can actually go out and do different things. The next question is from John Lewis. My question, why nails for the runners? Could screws be used and would it not be easier to change out the runners if and when necessary? Well, I use nails, I've always used nails on the runners on skiffs because one of the reasons is they go in way faster. It's just much less work to get that thing nailed on there than it is to screw it on. And uh, although screws would work just fine, 
screws become another problem. You've got to bury the head of the screw and either fill over it or something. And uh, the chances of gouging up the bottom plank and putting the screws in is quite a bit more than nailing. Now, really you'd think that, some people think that maybe I could take all those screws out of a runner and then take one of those runners off of there, but I can tell you for sure, I wouldn't want to back all those screws out of there at some point because the screws kind of marry to the wood a little bit. And uh, if I wanted to replace the runner, I would just cut it up and split it off and then push the screws or the nails out of the way anyhow. So it really doesn't make any difference whether it's screwed or nailed, I could get those runners off just about as fast one way or the other and uh, I think it'd be a lot easier to push the nails out than it would be to push the screws out really. Now, I like the look of the nails on the bottom, I like the work and uh, it's always been done that way so I'm just sticking with it. On this particular boat I decided that I would screw the center runner actually because the nails I had were a little bit too long for that center runner. The center runner is a little bit thinner than the others, so this one's going to have some of the runners nailed on and another one screwed on. I hope that makes everybody happy because there really is no reason why I couldn't use nails or screws. Now here's one from the Total Boat blog. Why did you use straight grain fur rather than white cedar for the bottom planking? In the past, I've repaired several skiffs that were originally built with white cedar. Well, in Narragansett Bay, they didn't build too many skiffs that were uh, work skiffs like this with, with white cedar bottoms. Most of all of them were built with either mahogany bottoms, which really kind of came on later, or fur bottoms just like this. These uh, edge grain fur bottoms are rugged, I can say that. They swell up really nice and tight. They're hard to wear out. Uh, cedar bottom, unless it's quarter sawn, you get tremendous amount of swelling and contracting if the boat were to uh, dry out or anything like that. And uh, there is some things about cedar bottoms that at one point I'd love to do a video about compression seams on cedar bottoms, but uh, I'm not going to uh, talk to you too much about that right now. But this is the material that I prefer and just about every skiff builder that I've talked to or known over the years has preferred for plank and bottoms on skiffs like this. Our next question is from Douglas Thomas. Hello, Merry Christmas. Well, Merry Christmas to you too. How did you transfer the starboard side shear line over to the port? I'm wondering how you maintain that same curvature. Well, it was pretty easy being that it was a skiff because with a skiff, you can actually take a tape measure and just hook it onto the bottom of the boat in line with one of the frames and just steal the measurement from one side and transfer it to the other. And that's exactly what I did. And I used that same batten that I used on the first side and kind of averaged through those lines. And I even checked the measurement to the first planking line right here because those are all identical on the boat too. So it matched up in two different ways. But it's a very, very simple thing to do. And uh, I'm surprised as many people have asked me questions about it. But then I got to thinking, if it was a round bilge boat, it would have been a whole lot more difficult to transfer that shear line in any respect like that. So it worked for a skiff and it worked very well, but it wouldn't work on every boat. Our next question here is from Mike Keen. Lou, how do you transfer the shear line on the starboard side to the port side so that the curves were precisely matched? Well, it really wasn't that difficult because I have a flat-sided boat here and I've already determined that the two bottom chine lines are very precisely matched and basically all I did was take a tape measure and measure straight up in line with the frames and uh, I took the measurement from one side and just transferred it to the other side. Now, I also took the same batten that I used to draw the line on the first side and it's obviously got the same rigidity and everything so I put it through those marks and I can tell you that it only missed a few of the marks by maybe a sixteenth of an inch or very, very, very slightly more than that and so I just averaged it through those marks and then I actually checked it against the first planking line here because all the planking lines in this boat are also precise. They're exactly the same on both sides. So what I did, did was measured it from the chines and then checked it from one of the planking lines and averaged it out with a batten and uh, drew a line on it and it's as close to the other side as I know how to make it. Our next question here is from Shadowcast and it says, 
Do you feel this is a good project for a beginner? I am familiar with woodworking and the tools, but I know very little about boats. Well, I'll tell you. I actually began building boats with skiffs like this, and uh, it just happened to be that way. Not everybody does. These boats can be a little difficult in some ways to build because the size of the lumber doesn't want to bend real easy, and uh, there's, there's different things about it. I think that it actually is a good boat for beginners, but I think there's probably better boats than this for beginners and smaller boats. In the first place, I always suggest for a beginner that they want to keep the boat that they build because it may not be marketable and uh, the thing is is you're going to want to enjoy it so make sure that you build a boat or begin with a boat that you want to use afterwards if this is the type of boat you want to use then it's a great boat for a beginner to build if it's not the type of boat that you want ultimately i'd begin with something else and there's a wide range of boat designs out there and that's something i could discuss with people later on i'm sure Thanks much. Very informative. If forced to use marine grade plywood building this boat instead of solid boards, what thickness plywood would you recommend? Well, I've built some boats like this with marine grade plywood. And uh, actually, I built a boat very much similar to this with 3 8 marine grade plywood. And the boat was fine, but I thought it was just a tiny bit light. And then I built another one with half inch marine plywood just for the sides and it had a fur bottom like this and I thought the half inch marine plywood was great for a boat like this really. The only reason why I didn't use it on this boat was I was trying to demonstrate with this particular boat how these skiffs used to be built and uh, I was trying to go very traditional here so that's what I've done. I've used plank sides and uh, a planked uh, bottom with fur like this and I viewed galvanized fastenings because that's what we always used to use on skiffs like this was galvanized fastenings. Believe me, if you get involved with like bronze fastenings for a boat like this, you're going to pay quite a bit more and uh, maybe before you even get started you'd probably shift over to galvanized fastenings if they were available. It's getting awful hard to find galvanized fastenings these days so probably the next skiff that I build and I think I'm going to build another one really, is going to be maybe stainless steel fastened. And uh, I, it seems to have worked out really well for another friend of mine, Skiff, and uh, I think I'm going to give it a chance next time myself. Our next question here is from some guy. Lou, I don't see you steaming any of the planks on the Skiff, and I was wondering, how do you decide whether to steam a board or just force it into place with clamps? Also, what's the limit of how thick a board can be for steaming to be effective? Well, there's two different questions there, and they're both quite a bit different, but really the way I decide about these boats as to whether or not I'm going to bend planks on without steam or with steam is, is that I've built so many of these boats before, and we just understand that this parabolic curve here with this type of plank, and whether it's pine or whether it's cedar or whether it's plywood, uh, Really, I think some of the stiffer wood that you could be using on a boat like this that you might really have to steam would be like Douglas fir, a quartered Douglas fir. That'd be a lot stiffer than this right here. So, I mean, I just know from experience that this boat's not going to need to be steamed, the planking on it. If anything need to be steamed in this boat, it would have been the chine logs, but I actually got away with forcing those into place without steaming as well. So, I think that that is the answer to the first question. Now, the second question is uh, about the thickness of planks that can be steamed. Well, I would just have to tell you this, that I know I steamed four-inch garbage planks on the schooner Coronet, and they went in like butter. So steaming is pretty effective whether or not you've got one-inch planks, two-inch planks, or six inch planks, I believe any thickness can be steamed as long as you do it properly and generate enough steam and give it enough time. The next comment and question we've got is from Speed Wharf. First off, I love these videos. Now how come the last frame closest to the transom is not at the same height as the shear planks like all the other frames? Well, that's pretty easy to answer. The uh, frames were cut down about two and a half inches lower than all the other frames because we're going to put a corner knee in there. 
right? And uh, that's going to be two and a half inches thick, and it's going to hover right over the top of those frames. So we've cut those down before we put the shear plank on so that I wouldn't have to make that cut up against the shear plank. So we've done the same exact thing up forward right here where the breast hook goes in. I've cut those frames down lower as well, really. Uh, this is going to be uh, kind of nice because I'm going to try to put in here uh, natural crooks I need a 60 degree natural crook for up forward and the ones back after about 100 degrees. Now, I've been having a little bit of trouble trying to obtain these knees and uh, I really would appreciate it if anybody would get in touch with us uh, that had access to knees like that, maybe out of red oak trees or even white oak trees or maybe even some other uh, variety. But uh, I'd like them to be some kind of hardwood and uh, you can either get in touch with us by email or just bring them right down to the shop and drop them off and uh, you know I'll even pay for some really really good ones because um, this has become just a tiny bit of a problem for us right now is obtaining the material for the breast hook and the quarter knees. The next question here is from Ann Teeve. What is a ton? I think that's what you were saying when you were talking about the shear at the bow. That is what I was saying. My father was a professional core hogger, like I said, and he did a lot of hand raking in the flats, but he also did what they called tonging way back, which you don't see too much these days. They do a little bit more bull raking for core hogs these days than tonging. There are people that still go out tonging, but very few here and there, and I think a living would be very hard to make tonging these days, but tongs are really like a giant pair of scissors that you reach over the size of the side of the boat with and you push them all the way to the bottom and they're vertical in the water and you actually work them kind of like a pair of scissors but they've got two baskets on the end and what happens is the baskets kind of groom the bottom a little bit like this and you 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 squeeze them together and then you pick up some of the bottom and shake it a little bit and shake out some of the mud and you can actually hear the core hogs inside the basket and you can tell uh, the sound of them, it's amazing that you can tell whether or not that's rocks in the baskets or whether or not it's core hogs. So once you've decided that you've got some core hogs in there, then you would pull the thing right straight up vertically until the top was very heavy and then fold it over the gunnels and then you would pick one of the handles up and put it on kind of like a little strut that stuck up on the other side of the boat and then you could reach in your baskets you know, without any danger and get the core hogs out that you've dug. It's really a nice way to core hog. It was a lot of fun. There's a lot of intricacies and methodology to it that I could talk about, but basically that's what a pair of tongs is. It's, a, it's two baskets on the end of two wooden poles set up kind of like a pair of scissors for core hogging. Ray saw. I've been watching all the skiff build videos and I find them relaxing and very interesting. I was taught traditional carpentry, so I appreciate your use of the fold and rule and many of the other little tricks that demonstrate your skill and experience. I've never built a boat, but now I'm seriously considering one. Thanks for all you have shared. Well, thank you for the comment, and uh, you know, I really appreciate people that have been taught traditional carpentry, even in another sense, because you know, the skills with the tools actually kind of cross over a little bit. So, you know, if you were taught to build homes or you built homes and you use skill saws and drills and all these different things, you actually use a lot of the same uh, equipment and tools when you're building boats. But I think that the building of boats comes from more of an understanding of the boats themselves and the form and that kind of stuff. So. I guess somebody that switches over is uh, at a little bit of a disadvantage, but I think if you do a little studying, and uh, today, the way to do that is to watch the videos, and you'll be able to build a boat, so thanks for commenting, and uh, I, uh, I hope you do build a boat in the future. Our next comment here is from Jack Gates. Fantastic as always. If you love wood, you gotta love Lou. By the way, who's that sad sack of sawdust that gave it a thumbs down? Well, I don't know, Jack, but uh, thanks for associating me with love and wood and all that kind of stuff because I do love wood, and believe me, the things I've been trying to teach come from experience and my love for wood and my love for my audience. So uh, I don't know who that guy is, but I'm not too worried about him. I'm more concerned about Jack Gates. Kevin Farrell sent our next comment in here. 
Please just show us this boat in action when done. Watching you use that circular saw is amazing. Well, I'll tell you what. I have every intention of showing you this boat when it's done. Sea trials and uh, maybe from drones because I just think that would look great. And we're going to have a little bit of a party. It won't be anything fantastic, but it's going to be great to put the boat in the water. And uh, I can tell you the second part of your uh, comment here, watching you use that circular saw is amazing. Well, you should be on my side of the circular saw because if I didn't think it wasn't amazing, I wouldn't even be using it. And it's really something to be on my side of that circular saw and see how much work a circular saw can actually perform. Our next comment here is from Adrian Williams. Great teachers don't just teach, they inspire. Louis, you really inspire us to get off the computer, out into the man cave, and make a boat, or anything really. Awesome stuff. Long may you prosper, friend. Well, thanks, Adrian, because uh, I'm actually trying to inspire people to get out into their man cave and pick up their tools. And uh, I love people that love hand tools, power tools, just about any kind of tools. And there's so many things to build out in the man cave. I just can't even imagine what people come up with. And uh, I've been kind of stuck on boats all my life, but I would say that whatever you're inspired to build, if it requires the use of tools, I'd go for it. Our next question here is from Night Raven. Another top-notch video, thank you. Question, what was the first boat you ever built and what was the biggest? Oh my goodness, I think the first boat that I ever built was actually, it was almost model size. It was a little V-bottom punt dinghy that was probably like four feet long. I remember my father and I building it together. We had already been working on boats and repairing boats, but that was the first boat that I actually built. And I call it a boat, not a model, because I was so young that I could actually get in it and, and float in it like a boat. So it was a boat, and uh, that was the first one. Then I built some uh, flat-bottom rowing skiffs after that and uh, went on from there. But now, what was the biggest? Well, I think that the biggest boat that I was involved with was uh, Freedom, was a 103-foot or a 4-foot Trumpy power yacht that was built in Portsmouth. And uh, I pretty much had control of the hull, the top sides, the deck, and the house. And then after that, I got off that project. So I figure I built that boat as well. And uh, that's the biggest boat I ever worked on. Now, I've worked on numbers of boats that were slightly smaller than that. So I've worked on quite a few bigger boats. I can't say that uh, I built any large schooners or anything like that, but I have worked on a lot of them. And I've done a tremendous amount of repair work. So I guess I hope that answers your question. That was the first boat I ever built. It was a little tiny dinghy, a really tiny dinghy. And the biggest one was Freedom, 104-foot Trumpy. This is fun. The next comment and question we've got here is from Jay Harris. Will there be any kind of thwarts or other horizontal bracing between the sides? If not, how do you keep the sides of the boat at the correct angle and prevent warping? Well, there doesn't have to be any because there's a number of things you can do here. We're probably going to put some knees from the gunnels down and onto the bottom of the boat and connected to the bottom runners through some bolts, but you wouldn't even really have to do that. All you'd really have to do is put a really good breast hook in it and a couple of really nice quarter knees and uh, the way it's fit together, that chine doesn't want to roll. It's got a whole ton of fastenings holding that chine to that bottom planking and that bottom planking doesn't want to bend either and the frames are connected to the chines and nothing really wants to move. You can even take this brace that I've got athwart ships up forward here right out of there and the boat doesn't even close up. So the next thing that we're going to do is put the gunnels on it like I said and the, uh, the gunnels themselves being that piece of wood on the top is kind of a broad piece of wood like this and cut to the curvature of the boat. So the whole gunnel itself, all the three pieces of it are going to help hold the boat perfectly uh, the way you see it shaped just like this without any thwarts or anything. Now thwarts could be put in it. Quarter, uh, uh, seats could be put in it. All kinds of things can be done to it but none of it has to be done because this boat will hold its shape without the aid of any of that kind of stuff. Our next question here is from Carbide Grinder. 
I wonder about the boat when it's planing. There's no keel. You have a flat bottom with no dead rise aft. How does it track? Does it skid around? Well, no, it doesn't skid around because the depth of the runners that I've got on this boat or plan to go on to this boat will really stop it from skidding around. And uh, they would skid around terrible without them, and they're almost dangerous, like I said, but that really stops the boat from doing it. And the other thing that stops the boat from having troubles is putting a little bit of lift rails on the sides of the boat so that when the bow of the boat hits the water, the boat water kind of speeds up. Say you were doing 25 knots and you stuffed the bow into a wave a little bit the water hitting the sides of the boat might be doing 35 or 45 knots and then it hits those lift rails and it just pops the bow of the boat back up out of the water instantaneously. So it's got to keep the bow up on top of the water and uh, it does that quite nicely and it just doesn't need any dead rise back aft or anywhere else. It's a flat bottom skiff for the reasons of the structure and the way the space works out and the way you use it. So. We wouldn't want to make it a V-bottom or have any dead rise aft or anything like that, but we do want to stop it from skidding around, and that's what those runners are going to do. Our next question here is from GS. Lou, great skills, jolly good work. Would you consider doing a V-shaped hull, thus without the flat bottom? You would still use chines. Wouldn't this work and make the skiff more hydrodynamic? Well, I would certainly consider building a V-bottom skiff because I've already designed a new type of V-bottom skiff with kind of a whole new kind of structure than I'm familiar with. And uh, it's really going to be an opportunity, I think, someday for me to be able to put that skiff together. As a matter of fact, I've got some of the things for that skiff already made. I've made the transom and the stem, and I've kind of uh, got the side plank and all fit together. So I think it's in the future here that I will definitely be building a V-bottom skiff. And, uh, It'll definitely be more hydrodynamic as well. I mean, it won't pound anywhere near as much, but I intend to have it have the flavor of a work skiff like this. When you look at it and when you use it, you'll know that you're in a skiff and not in some other kind of fiberglass boat. Kelly 56, can you show the details of how you set the block plane to plane the transom? You mentioned that you are using the corner of the blade somehow. Thanks for great videos. Well, thank you. And I am using the corner of the blade on that little block plane. I've kind of got it set up uh, a certain way, and it's taken quite a bit of experience and time to figure out how to get the best use out of a block plane. One of the harder little tools that I've ever seen to use, they seem to chatter a lot if you don't have them set exactly right and uh, especially some of the lighter weight and cheaper ones, but I find those to be the best ones that I can use. I like those little block planes, and I've thrown a few of the parts away. I've made it adjustable a little bit differently than the way they had it, and uh, I've got it sharpened so the blade is actually straight across, but the corners of the blade are curved up just the tiniest bit on the corner, so it doesn't have that raw 90-degree corner to the end of the blade, but it is sharp all the way to the edge of the blade. Now, I've got it adjusted so the blade's only sticking out and only useful on one side. So, kind of like in the middle of the blade, it just kind of starts cutting, and then it gets a little bit deeper as it goes over to the edge of the plane. And uh, it makes it so that you can plane across end grain and different things much, much easier than it would if you had the plane set right straight across. Now, I'd like to kind of show you some of that uh, in detail in the camera later on, but I guess that would be my uh, immediate explanation of that. Don Harding has sent our next question in here. I have the best question for you. Will you help me build one? Love watching you build this boat. Well, Don, yes, I will help you build one. And uh, if you were close enough, I'd literally help you physically. But uh, I think the biggest help that you could possibly get would be to look at this series of videos very seriously over and over again. And I think that you'd find there's enough help within the contents of those videos for you to be able to go out and build a boat like this. From Kad Zali, my question is how has the shipbuilding industry changed in your lifetime? What's changed for the better and what's changed for the worst? I just want to say thank you for these videos. I can be having a crappy day, but after watching one of your weekly videos, I feel instantly better. Thank you, Lou. Thank you. 
Well, the chip building industry has definitely changed in my lifetime, but I don't think I can testify to all the ways that that's happened. I'm really not a ship builder necessarily, but I do build boats. But I know that ships have changed radically in their design, in the methodology that they've taken to build them, and obviously the oldest ships that we know of were built in wood, and today you're not building too many ships at all in wood. I would say they're mostly yachts or boats. Now, uh, the other thing is, is that um, uh, I really appreciate for saying to me that uh, you feel better instantly after watching my videos because I think it's therapeutic that people get involved with work, you know, and I think part of it is the learning of it and the other part of it is the performing of it. So I think what you're catching on to here is the learning of some of the woodwork and I just encourage you to go out and perform some of it as well because it's just going to get better from here. Our next comment is from Music Searcher. This has been a great build series. I'd like to ask, when you use a boat term like gunnel, could you explain what it is or where it is at? I appreciate the nomenclature, but I get lost with some of the names. Keep up the great work from a non-boating person who admires a craftsman. Well, I think it's been a great build series myself. I've enjoyed it more so actually than just building a boat because we've been able to document the building of the boat at the same time. And uh, I've used quite a bit of nomenclature in my videos because I think it makes them attractive. And I think that if you were to very carefully look at the videos, you would find out that I try to explain most of the things as I, as I mention them now, I'll explain to you exactly what gunnel actually means for this one particular question here. The gunnel of the boat really is the cap or the piece of wood that covers the end of the frames. It's not the whole area. It really refers mostly to that one piece of wood that covers the ends of the frames. And uh, I, all my life, I've, I've really referred to the entire structure with the guards on the outside and the cap and the inside whale and all of it as the gunnel. But I think more correct than that is it refers to that one piece of wood that covers the frame ends. We've got the next comment from Bobby John. He says, Beautiful. Will this skiff be left in the water or will it be trailed? Thanks. Well, I don't know that I really have the answer to that because I hope that eventually this skiff isn't going to be mine. So I guess whatever, whoever buys it can do what they want, but they're best left in the water most of the time. I mean, obviously every boat's going to be taken out and painted and all these different things, but it'd be really nice if a skiff like this spent its whole life soaked up. That's not usually the case. What happens usually is, is uh, they spend a little bit of time out of the water and the bottom does dry out and the spaces between the planks and all kinds of different things happens to them, but they can be swelled back up and used. So I think that the best thing for a person to do is keep it in the water, but some people get away with actually trailing them because they would put like a piece of indoor outdoor carpet inside the boat and soak that with water so the sun doesn't beat on the bottom of the boat or something that soaks up water that they can take in and out when they go to use the boat. And uh, that really keeps the bottom nice and tight. So exactly what's going to happen to this boat, I don't know, but uh, I hope it's taken care of somehow. Our next question is from MSY Kasia. Another great video. How big of an outboard motor are you planning on having on this one? And greetings from Norway. Well, we don't know that either because I don't want to own the boat when it's complete, but I think that it would be really nice to do sea trials with this boat with 40 horsepower or maybe even as much as 60 horsepower. But if it were used for a launch or something like that in a harbor, it would probably only require something like 25 horsepower. So it's pretty flexible. You could even run this boat effectively and use it effectively with less horsepower than that if you weren't planning on planing. And it really depends on how much weight you're going to put in the boat. So this thing could go from 15 horsepower to 90 horsepower, seriously. David Riggs sent this next one in. I love watching your videos. I've learned so much. I hope someday to build my own skiff. Please start a new project as soon as this skiff is finished. Well, David, thanks for this comment. And uh, 
I really appreciate you loving my videos as much as you do, and I would suggest that you definitely someday build a skiff, because if you could have as much fun building it as I do building this one, and all the other projects that I do in the wood, uh, I'd just be as happy for you as could possibly be. And the other thing I'd like to say is that I will definitely be starting another project when this project is complete. I'm not sure at this point exactly what it's going to be, but it's going to be shortly after this one's completed. Our next question here is from Aaron. Love the series. I'm guessing we'll get to see the boat in the water this spring. Also, do you work for yourself or a shipyard, and who owns the boat? Well, you will be seeing the boat in the water this spring, that's for sure, and maybe even a little bit before spring if we have our way, but uh, there's going to be a little kind of a party when we launch it and stuff like that. Now, uh, I don't work for a boat yard. I work for myself and have for years and years. Sometimes I get together on other projects in boat yards in different places and uh, kind of get together and run crews and different things like that. But basically, I work for myself and uh, I build boats like this and all kinds of different things and I do a lot of different repair work. And uh, I like it that way. It's, uh, I don't have a boss. The other thing I do is get together with my videographer and my team and we document things like this. Now that's really been the most fun thing that I've done in years and I uh, have every intention of continuing with that. And uh, the last part of this question is, who owns the boat? Well, I own the boat, but I like the boat, but I really wish I didn't own the boat. And, uh, I'm going to make it available probably on eBay at some point very shortly and uh, I think that uh, I won't have any trouble selling it to somebody else who will appreciate it just as much as myself. Now next week we're probably going to do a little bit more of this question and answer stuff because it's really been fun for me and we haven't answered all the questions so we're going to do exactly the same thing next week and send a few more questions in because we're looking forward to them we haven't picked those questions out yet so take a look at all the videos find out what you like or don't like or whatever it is i don't really care what it is and send those questions in because i'm ready to try to answer them